On today's episode, we're deploying the long duration exposure facility, repairing SolarMax, and we're going to be talking about a very interesting mid deck experiment on today's episode of End of Mission, the podcast where we talk about space missions that have ended. I'm Paul, the pressure fed astronaut. And who are you? Uh, hi, hello. Thank you for entering into my house and stealing the keys back to the, uh, to the podcast. I'm face of sarcasm. I, I am here. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about a space mission today. And yes, okay, I know about the Starship update that happened three hours after I did my video. Since I know half you're going to comment about that. I'll just say this. We'll talk more about an IFT4. But that video was very embarrassing. If I ever made a presentation like that for my rocket company, just give me the big Jerry Bull treatment. I understand. Ooh, that's... Yeah. Okay. What? Just, yeah, that's, I'm saying all right. that. All right. So, yep, so we're talking uh, about uh, STS-41C today. As you can see, here's the the pictures I picked. Uh, yeah. What do, you, what do you think's going on in this one? I kind of give you a hint. Well, oh, it's the uh, the solar eclipse, right? Because we recently had the solar eclipse, and so we're being topical finally, right? We actually are kind of topical because this is the fortieth anniversary of the mission. Oh, I, nice! I, I didn't realize that. <laughs> I, I follow the Happy NASA birthday, hi- everyone! <laughs> yeah, I, I follow the NASA history office on Twitter. And yeah. I went, Wait, I recognize that launch photo. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you say that like, oh no, that's a bad thing. <laughs> oh no, just it just you know it's. I don't plan these things. It just happened by accident, yeah. Yeah. So we were to talk about STS-41C. Uh, so we're gonna, we actually have a little background on this one coming up first. Oh, yeah? So we're going to talk about the Solar Maximum Mission. All right. So Solar Max, SMM, that guy, is a spacecraft designed to observe solar flares during the Solar Maximum, Yeah, this during the sunspot cycle. Uh, what, well, yeah, what is the solar maximum? Is that when there's like most uh, solar? Is that when there's least amount of sunspots or most amount of sunspots? I don't remember. One of those two. One of those two. Okay, so one. The, <laughs> one of those two. Uh, it's also the first of six spacecraft owned and operated by the United States government that use the multi-mission modular spacecraft bus. So this diagram right here is Solar Max, as you can see. You okay. have the solar rays. So right up here, this right. is the experiments, but this is the bus. That's so it's the got, bus. Yeah, so it's modular. It's not yellow. It should it be yellow? Because well, it's that, a bus. Well, that part's yellow. It's kind of red. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, so the idea was to build more modular spacecraft, you know, to standardize them for NASA missions to reduce costs. Right. Uh, only six of these ever flew, all in the 90s. Not 90s, the 80s and 90s. Mm. So. Okay, so it's very standardized, short-lived program. <laughs> yeah, NASA keeps trying this, and it sort of works, but it sort of doesn't. Oh. The, the problem is, you can't really have the same bus go to Mercury and then to Mars. Wait, no, Mariner did that sort of... No, they had to modify it extensively, though. But it's you start looking at mission requirements, you can reuse basic things like software, but when you get down to some more complicated things, you can't really do it. But the idea here was you'd build, like, attitude control. Mm-hmm into it but that so it it can okay program so so basically every single mission is like its own little special snowflake because you can't really build like a standardized bus you can each of them. some of them have them like the landsat has a standardized bus it's been improved but mm-hmm. you can't make turn a landsat into a moon probe oh okay so that makes sense yeah we might talk about that at some point in a special episode or something okay uh the one of the specific requirements for this though was it had to be Shuttle compatible. Shuttle compatible. Oh, so it had to fit into the shuttle, right? Yep, and it has an RMS grapple feature. Uh, Ooh. Actually, we'll see it, because we're talking about it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. Uh, I hope so. So there's uh, so there's seven experiments on board. A chronograph polarimeter, which looks at the solar corona, prominences, and flares. So the part that when you the eclipse happened this week, mm-hmm. the part that the moon didn't blot out. Oh, okay. The, like the, the stuff around the sun. Yeah. A uh, UV spectrometer and polarimeter, which looks at solar, ultraviolet, and Earth's atmosphere for fun, I guess. Oh, that's cool. A soft X-ray po- uh, polychromator. I, it's got multiple colors, I guess. Polychromator. Uh, poly. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they have a mon- monago pro- chromator on it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Maybe they're looking at like different colors of X-rays. It could be. Yeah. 
So it's looking at solar flares and active solar regions again, solar maximum. Right. It has the when hard, stuff is happening. Yeah, so they have the hard X-ray spectrometer. So it did it did time, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's out on parole. It's uh, got tattoos. Yeah. Going to gang. Yeah. Uh, it looks at solar active regions and flares, obviously. They have the hard X-ray burst spectrometer. Did time with uh, other X-ray spectrometer, you know, mm-hmm. up at Joliet or something. That's a reference to the Blues Brothers. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You got soft x rays. Yep. <laughs> I work 85 hours a day. You got soft x rays. Exactly. <laughs> so this looks at solar flares and active regions. It's got a gamma ray spectrometer, which looks like gamma rays from the sun. <laughs> You know, uh, okay. so, there's a, yeah, so it's basically taking parts. a look at it's, so it's basically taking a look at the electromagnetic spectrum of the sun. Yeah, it's looking at the sun. <laughs> wow. Uh, then we have an active cavity cavity radiometer irradiance monitor. So it's a dentist that looks at the so it's got the, the yeah, cavities got, of the sun. Yeah, so it's got oh, a little so, so it's thing. when the, there is the uh, the uh, the sunspots right then because that's that's yeah. when it has the, the plaque and the cavities. Yeah, so the, it's got a little mirror, right? It's got a little mirror to look at the to poke and prod and ask you invasive questions while you can't answer them. Yeah, you know? and then you like spit out all the water that they shove into your mouth for some reason. Yeah. So this launches Valentine's Day, uh, nineteen eighty. This is a picture of the launch on a Delta, probably a three thousand. I think that's a Delta three thousand. Okay. They all look the same at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Insensitive, but wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, trust me. Look at the deltas in the eighties. Identical. And also, the last delta floor, <laughs> delta floor. <laughs> That's delta, delta flu <laughs> this week. So rest in peace, delta. R.I.P. Uh, so this is put into a five hundred ten kilometer orbit. So about three hundred sixteen miles up at twenty eight point five degrees. So it's due east out of the Cape. Okay. Right. But something happens in November 1980. <gasps> it what breaks. Happens? Two Uh-oh. of the four fuses in the attitude control system fail. Mm. So that's the part that keeps it oriented right. Right. That's what attitude right. control is. So that's, a, that's what keeps it pointed at the sun as yeah. it orbits the Earth. Right. So that breaks. Uh-oh. It's not good. How are you supposed to look at the sun if you can't look at the exactly. sun? Exactly. So they use uh, magnetorquers. So it uses magnetic fields and torque to adjust it. Oh, that's I mean, cool. They use that to maintain some control, but that means only three of the seven instruments are working. That's why? That's not good. Yeah, yeah, why are why are four why are over half of them like not working anymore? Well, I assume they're not the hard parts. They don't they haven't done time, so there's you know Ah, uh, the the soft X rays. Yeah. But it's due east out of the Cape, relatively mm-hmm. low orbit, shuttle compatible. Hey, wait a second. <laughs> the shuttle is going to be the replacement for all space things. Use it. Yeah. Go fix it. Yeah. So this Grab leads... your, put put yourself, you know, get the the blue boiler suit, right? Put your hat on, get the wrench and go at it. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget your high vis jacket though. Can't forget that. Yeah. So it's put in safe mode until 1984. <laughs> so it breaks in 1980 and it's not repaired until 1984. It takes a while. Okay. So this leads to STS-41C. And here is our crew. So our commander is Bob Crippen, also known as Cripp. He was born September 11th, 1937. He's from Beaumont, Texas. He's a Navy test pilot engineer from Astronaut Group 7. Uh, He's an MOL guy. That's where he came from. Uh, He did SMEET, which is the Skylab on the ground testing. Wow. He was the pilot on STS-1. Whoa. <laughs> and also, it's the anniversary of that uh, yesterday for us. Oh, nice. April 12th. And then, of course, we last saw him on STS-7, on our first space shuttle mission episode, which is we had cursed. to re-record? Yeah. The Constantly. lost episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you so, cannot find if you subscribe to uh, Pressure Fed Astronaut. <laughs> yeah. Uh, our pilot is Francis Richard Dick Scobie. He was born May 19th, 1939. And, uh, well, he, he died on January 28th, 1986. Oh, that's not long after this, is that? He, he was the commander of Challenger. Oh. Yep. Uh, he's an Air Force pilot engineer who graduated from the University of Arizona. He's uh, from Astronaut Group 8, the 25, uh, the 35, 25, the new, the TFNGs, as they're called. Uh, okay. Uh, he was a pilot on the shuttle 747 carrier aircraft, so he flew that, and that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. And yeah. he, had a, yeah, he had an extensive history flying for the Air Force. Mm. So this is his first and, well, only flight. 
unfortunately. Yeah. Mission Specialist 1 is Terry Hart, also known as TJ. That is a very 80s name. Yeah. Terry Hart. It's like a band. Like uh, Bonnie Tyler. Yeah. You know, that, that's a very 80s name. I can feel that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was born on October 27th, 1946. He's from Pittsburgh, so yeah, I can understand wanting to go to space. Yep. Uh, he was a pilot in the Air Force, and he was an electrical engineer, so yeah, okay, yeah. It's from MIT, though, and Rutgers, which are very, you know big universities uh-huh okay he's a tfng of course mm-hmm. uh obviously has no space flight experience <laughs> oh so he's the intern of the flight he's one of the yeah well they're all new guys the only one with any space flight experience is bob crippen oh okay yeah again they're starting to get the those astronauts into the rotation now okay okay so our mission specialist two is james dougal adrianus van hoofden what a name <laughs> And they called him Ox. <laughs> yeah, all the letters that you have in your name, yeah, forget that. We're calling you Ox. <laughs> he was six, he's 6'4". Six he's oh, tall. Wow. He's a big guy. Yeah. He's the Ox. Yeah. yeah. He was born June 11th, 1944. He's from Fresno, California. Uh, he's a Navy pilot, an engineer. He went to Colorado State. I think he was in fluids. So. Ew. He's like, like hydraulics and stuff. And of course, he's TFNG, so he has no space flood experience. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then Mission Specialist 3 is George Nelson. <laughs> Pinky, as they called him. No relation uh, to Babyface Nelson. Uh, George, not the livestock. <laughs> I knew this is where we'd go with that. <laughs> he was uh, born July 13th, 1950, so he's the youngest guy in this mission. He's only 34. Wow. Yeah. He's from Charles City, Iowa, which we've what? driven through. Really? Yes, it's on... You know when you go right, you go south 35, uh, drive at Mason uh-huh. City, then you turn uh, left to go east on 218? Mm-hmm. That's the first city you encounter. Okay. So, yeah, we've driven through this place. But he considers Wilmar, Minnesota, his home. Hey, hey. Yep. There we go. Yep. Uh, he's a physicist and astronomer who graduated from the University of Washington. So, yeah, he does a lot of astronomy. Uh, oh, is, awesome. This is the first of three space flights for him. Nice. Yeah. Uh, he's from Astronaut Group 8, of course. Uh, he was Capcom on STS-3 and STS-4. Oh, wow. Yeah. He robbed banks, I guess, well, <laughs> before that. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to pay for college somehow, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so our orbiter on this flight is Challenger. This is okay. the 11th flight of the Space Shuttle program, but its original name is STS-13. Well, okay, so it's the 11th flight of the space shuttle. It's called STS-13, but it's also named STS-41C. This is the reason why NASA adopted that, the 41C thing. Why? There was a guy who did the numbering scheme who had triskaidekaphobia, which is the fear of the number 13. And considering how the last flight with 13 in it went... <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. We're also on the anniversary of that one. Oh, cool. Yeah. Happy birthday, everyone. Yeah. A lot of anniversaries on this on today. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the fifth flight of Challenger. They're really okay. getting this thing going. And then, a lot of numbers. <laughs> I like doing this to kind of get you where we're at. Okay. Yeah. And then the previous mission was actually STS forty one B of Challenger, which is the flight before this one. Okay. So they're really going hard on Challenger. Yeah. Well, it's the second orbiter, and they they have to fix Columbia because the APUs caught fire on STS nine. Oh. And they were upgrading it after they flew it a few times. Yeah. Ah. Uh, so. Th- yeah, that, that makes sense to, uh, to start going with the second uh, orbiter. Yeah. They're, again, this is when they're starting to really ramp the shuttle program into what they want it to be. Again, this okay. is, right? Because you're going to go fix a satellite. No mission before that had done this. Yeah. And the shuttle is supposed to be able to do this. Start here. This is where you start. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to deploy the Long Duration Exposure Facility, LDEF, and demonstrate the shuttle system to capture and repair spacecraft on orbit with the RMS and EVA. That's, yeah, that's bold. Yeah, really cool. Yeah. I've picked a lot of these missions, haven't I? (laughs) This is the second one we're doing that does a uh, spacecraft recovery. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, this is the first one to do it, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So this is a crew photo here. 
There they all are. Awesome. Crip, TJ, Ox, Pinky, and uh, Dick. So this is the original mission patch here. STS-13. Ah, yeah. Yep. And, of course, this is the joke patch below it. <laughs> right? It's a black cat, number 13. The shuttle's flying under it. Right? It's cursed. <laughs> yeah. And then... Oh, awesome. So here's our mid-deck experiment. This is the only one that's not, like, uh, the radiation monitoring, crew exercise, you know, the basics, what you already have lying on the shuttle. Mm-hmm. This is Shuttle Student Involvement Project SC-82.2. Uh, dash 17 a comparison of honeycomb structures built by apis millifera what apis millifera are bees 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 they put bees on the space shuttle 3300 bees Thir- oh my gosh <laughs> yes that guy so this is the principal investigator who helped develop it i forgot his name but uh, yeah, so he's holding a container full of bees. <laughs> it's a student. So students thought of this from Waverly, Tennessee, which is uh, west of Nashville, but now we're west of Nashville. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure I never encounter anyone from that school because, you know, <laughs> you know right? I don't know. I might encounter the guy who thought of this, you know, you know yeah. lightning flashes. You hear, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So yeah, it's yeah Waverly. If you actually go there, it's actually just a giant medieval castle. Yeah, and there's storms just perpetually over it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm gonna put three thousand bees on the space shuttle. Yep. Why? Because. <laughs> and everyone's name is Igor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they're gonna see if bees can build honeycombs in space. Okay, so they're okay. They're looking at their architectural skills in a zero g environment. That's interesting. Yeah, that's that's an actual interesting experiment. It's just thirty three hundred bees. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah, just imagine if that thing broke. Oh, that, that would be a very fun mission. <laughs> this mission would be much more interesting. <laughs> yeah, should have kept the thirteen, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that would have been way worse. <laughs> way corkers. So yeah, so that's, they're putting bees in space. Just because. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just because. I gotta get out of my system. <laughs> yeah. And so here's what's in the payload bay. LDEF and then the repair equipment for Solar Max. Okay. So what's LDEF? It's Come the Long Duration Exposure Facility. Exactly. You said that. All yeah, right. Exactly. It's a recoverable space experiment free flyer meant to be deployed from the space shuttle payload bay for long duration flights. So about 18 months. So you put experiments okay. in space on the shuttle for up to 18 months and then you bring them back down. Okay. You put experiments on it, right? Yeah, yeah. long term, long duration. Right. Space program. You want it, The space shuttle is going to do everything. Mm-hmm. You got to do you know, space experiments. Yeah. Got to see what you're up against. Exactly. So this thing's 30 feet long, 14 feet in diameter, so 9 meters by 4.4 4 and a quarter meters in diameter. It's a 12-sided cylinder, capable of supporting 86 experiments. Dang, that's a lot of experiments. 72 on the cylinder body and 14 on the ends. Wow. The experiment trays are 34 inches wide, 50 inches long, and they can be about 12 inches deep. So that's about 0.86 by 1.27 by 0.3 meters for our metric folks i mean you could almost fit a body in that you could put a lot of bees in there <laughs> yeah you could put thirteen thousand bees in there you have a lot more bees in there yeah yeah so what's unique about this is there's no power or telemetry or propulsion systems on ldef if you want power supply you build it for yourself oh so it's basically just a big cylinder in space yeah it's a cylinder you mount stuff onto and launch it from the space shuttle into space okay and on this flight, there are 57 experiments. Okay. Uh, in total, they weigh 21,400 pounds. Wow. Or about 9.7 metric tons. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. <laughs> now, I have a list of all 57. I'm not going to list all of them. Because Aww. that would take forever. It'd be really boring. So if you want us to do a special on that, just say so. <laughs> Or you could take a look at the uh, look at the description to find the links to read them for yourselves, right? Yeah, I guess. Nerd. Yeah. Nerd. Who'd, who'd want to read that, though? 
<laughs> yeah, nerds. <laughs> what? Just, Who'd who put 3,000 bees in space? <laughs> Some maniacal madman. Yeah. So here's a few that I found that are I found interesting. So the first one's the most important. Yeah. A0201, it's got a diagram of the, that's where the numbers come from. Interplanetary okay. dust experiment. Yes. A dust counter. Yes. <laughs> uh, P4-1 is seeds in space. So they actually put oh. tomato seeds up on this thing. Uh, P5 okay. is space aging of solid rocket materials. So you want to see how long solid rocket motors last in space. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, 138-10 is micro welding of various metallic materials under ultra vacuum. Ooh, that sounds really cool. That is really interesting. Uh, 44 is holographic data storage crystals for LDF. That, wow. sounds, that sounds like something out of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, that, that's some serious sci-fi stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, 15 is free flyer biostack experiments. Some more biology experiments. Uh, okay. So the plan is to recover this thing in about March 1985. Okay. Uh, it doesn't get recovered in 1985. I'll just say that. Ooh. Okay. So here's a diagram of its operations, for example. So you got, right, so you can see there's, it's going to be gravity gradient stabilized. So one end is always facing towards Earth, and the other end is always facing towards space. Okay. That's just how it's built. That's how it goes. And we'll see, okay. we see pictures of it. So here it is under construction there. So Ooh. you can kind of see the, the big structure of it. And you can see the RMS uh, grapple feature there. Ah, okay. Right, because it's got, you know, Canada Arms got to pick it up and just throw it out. Right. And then this right here is a diagram of all the experiments and where they go. Oh, okay. So it is just a big chart. <laughs> yeah. It's, again, it's, it's the standardization of space experiments and space equipment. That is really smart, actually. Yeah. yeah. NASA does this with ISS. We learned a lot during this program. Oh, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. And so what also is in the payload bay are what's called the T-pad assembly. So this is the Trunnion pin, uh, uh, protrusion actuator device. It's going to, so the astronaut's going to get an MMU. It's going to grab onto this. It's going to mm-hmm. fly up to Solar Max and grab onto it. Oh, okay. This is what's going to grapple onto it. Okay. So this is the thing that's going to grapple onto it. And you can see all the, again, there's so much to look at here. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a lot. There's control boxes. There's actuators. Right, so the astronaut's going to go up and grab onto it. That's pretty much what's in the payload bay, as well as the uh, re- uh, repair equipment. But I couldn't find any good diagrams of that. Oh. Okay. I'm, I'm still busy. That's the reason. But ah. So this is also in the payload bay. Got it. And this is the crew under training Ooh. in the water. Ooh. Yep. Uh, I don't know who this is right here. They have uh, glasses. They have glasses. I'm going to bet this is George Nelson. I think this okay. is Nelson. Uh, yeah, so you can see this is the underwater training facility. This is how they're training how to do this, right? So you can kind of see how big Solar Max is. Yeah, pretty pretty decently sized. Yeah, it's a decent sized spacecraft. Now, the other thing you'll notice here on the right-hand picture is see, he's wearing spacesuit gloves and he's got tools. Yes. This will be an issue. Oh. Remember, these are big gloves. Yeah. Tiny screws. Tiny. Ooh. Yeah. So Didn't think that, about that. Yeah, it's, well... First time for everything, right? Hey, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what's testing. Yep, so here they are again. So this is Nelson here. He's in the MMU simulator. Okay. Because he's the only guy who wears the MMU in this flight. Okay. So, so you can do the, here they're doing the experiments on it. You get the divers. And then uh, here's Ox, yeah, I guess, refueling it. Yeah, he's at the pump. Yep. Putting yeah. gas in the tank. Yeah. All right, so this is the crew walking out at the welding station. Mm-hmm. I want you to pay attention. So these two guys back here, so this is George Abbey. He just died recently. Oh. Yeah. He was the guy who's in charge of crew selection for all of these missions. Oh. Mike Mullane's autobiography doesn't necessarily paint the best picture of him, so we'll leave it at that. But, Ooh. well, being an astronaut is a very stressful position, and at, according to Mullane, it got to the point where crews would... Would like astronauts would look at the parking lot, see where people were parked, just to divine who got crew selections. So, okay, there's a lot of issues with it. And then this astronaut right here is John Young. Ah, he was okay. also like head of the astronaut office at the time. But yeah, so here's the crew walking out at the welding shack, mm-hmm. and this is the launch. Nice. Yeah, I always like some good launch photos. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
So cool. All right. So the original launch date is going to be April 4th, 1984. But on 41B, there were some TPS issues on the Ohms pods. They wanted to fix those before launching again. So delayed by two days. Okay. So it's April 6th. Yep. And it launches at 8.58 in the morning Eastern. So right up at the crack of dawn. This is the first (laughs) direct ascent launch of the orbiter. So normally on flights beforehand, so they do, right, they'd launch SRB SEP, main engine cut off, and they'd fire ohms to push the shuttle to the correct apogee they were aiming for for their first orbit. And then at apogee, they'd raise their perigee out of the atmosphere. Okay, so they get so they get the uh, apogee up and then raise up the the perigee to get it yeah. into orbit. Part of it's do abort modes and things like that. So you could do once around aborts. This one mm-hmm. did not do that first ohms burn. They just did the circularization. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was direct ascent to to orbit. Yep, that's what it's direct ascent. So their first orbit is. Uh, it's really hard to figure out which orbit they went to first, okay? The Wikipedia page gives you the wrong orbit. The mission, uh, the press kit gives you the wrong orbit. I tried to guess which one it went to. It's <laughs> 416 kilometers is about 288 miles at 28 and a half degrees. Due east out of the Cape. Okay. Now, on this flight, there were two issues with the right-hand SRB. So that is the one that we can't see. This guy. Okay, the one on the other side. That one, yeah. And you can tell the difference between them because the port SRB has a black stripe on it up top. Okay. One of them's going to be very important for Challenger. Uh, there was a gas leak and erosion on one of the O-ring seals called Flowby. <laughs> Ooh. Yes. And then on recovery, one of the three parachutes failed to deploy. That's not good. Uh, well, compared to the... Well, the first ones, I think, is more important, if you ask me. Uh, I mean, yeah, but still, I mean, they're both kind of important. They're very imp- both are important, but one's more important. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so then on April 7th, LDEF is deployed into orbit. We will not be seeing LDEF again until 1990 <laughs> on STS-32. Uh, yeah, just just five years behind uh, schedule. Yep. <laughs> when they recovered, it was basically going to fall out of the atmosphere. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was that far gone. So then after that, Challenger raises its orbit to 560 kilometers, or about 348 miles, to rendezvous with Solar Max. Okay. And okay. Here's, the, so here's the deployment of Aldaf. You can see it. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah. there's Terry on the, uh, on the RMS lifting it out. And that right there actually is an IMAX camera. Wow. Yeah, this is the first flight with IMAX cameras on it, filming the documentary uh, The Dream is Alive. Oh. Yep. Didn't realize Christopher Nolan snuck in yeah. this, on the mission. Dedicated to detail. Yeah. Yep. So here's LDEF in space. So you can see how it's how it looks, all the different experiments on board. Yeah. So these right here are trunnions. So this is where they mount it into the payload bay. Okay. That's how they hold it in. Yeah, and the RMS just picks it up and tosses Yeats. it out. Eats it. Yep. So there it is. Look at that. Wow. All 57 experiments. Yeah. Look at it go. Farewell. See you in a decade. See ya. <laughs> Bye. A feeder's in. <laughs> just, they just watch this wave for the next hour. It's a Minnesota goodbye because, you know, George Nelson's from you know, Minnesota. He's just, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. You wait about 90 minutes and then yeah. you actually leave. Yeah. All right. So now, this is going to be the fun part. April 8th, Mission Day 3, Solar Max Recovery. Yes. So right now, the crew at the people at Goddard Space Flight Center, they're the ones running Solar Max, have put <laughs> have left the spacecraft in a certain orientation, and it's got a bit of a rotation for stability, right? Okay. Okay. George Nelson is going to get in the MMU, the mm-hmm. Manned Maneuvering Unit, get the T pad, and he's going to go out, up to Solar Max, okay. and on Solar Max, in the space between the payload and the equipment, is a grapple, so they can grip onto it with the T pad. Okay. He's going to grab onto that and use the MMU to stop it from spinning. Okay. Now, Goddard will have deactivated attitude control on Solar Max for when George grabs onto it so it doesn't freak out. Right? Right, right. So then, Bob Crippen and Dick Scobie are going to maneuver Challenger closer to Solar Max, and then they're going to grapple it with the RMS and put it in the payload bay. Okay. okay. Then, they're going to start to work on replacing two things. They're going to fix the attitude control system and the main electronics box on the polarimeter. Okay. The polarimeter is the hard one. 
Why is it the hard one? Because it's got really small screws on it. Oh, right. Yeah. So wait, like, make sure I got this all right here. So the astronauts then use the module service tool. So that's like a drill, basically. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> to unscrew two retention bolts holding the control system in place. These will be removed, replaced, and they'll replace it. There's a new one in the payload bay. They're going to replace them, right? You'll see yeah, it. I hope, hope you, you brought, I hope yeah. remember to pack it in. <laughs> hey, guys, you forget something? Where's the 10 millimeter socket? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> guys. Oh, no. Ox, hold the flashlight. <laughs> yeah. So the main electronics box with a hard one because they actually have to cut open the insulation because it's going to be up here in the payload section. Uh -oh. Open it up, and he's gonna, and Ox is going to put hinge on so they can open it up and replace the electronics. Okay. That's the hard part because they got to you know screw it out, and it's you know, little parts. Right. Uh, so they remove four of the six screws holding this door in place. Okay. And then they're going to go inside and rest for the next few days. <laughs> <laughs> Took the door off. Yeah, you know, yeah, got to gotta take a nice you know two two day break. <laughs> to get a nice two day break. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the repairs plan for day five, and then then redeploy this on day six. Okay. Now I've told you all of this. Yes. Does this mean it'll happen as I say? Uh, if I've ever learned anything from watching Scooby Doo, when Fred tells the plan, it doesn't work. Exactly. So, so here's George Nelson suiting up. So okay. So what he's wearing there is uh, it's a cooling jacket for the spacesuit because he it's a, so it's got water hoses all around it. Right, to keep him cool. Right. Manage right. his temperature. Because he's in space, right? Yeah. He's got the space suit on. You can see the exposed like lines and all that. Mm -hmm. So he's suiting himself up. And then behind him, you can see Ox. He's suiting up. Right. And there's Solar Max. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. And then there's George Nelson going to go out to fix it. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's two images. It's two images. Yeah. You can see the split right about there. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Just, they look a lot alike. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I was a little, I was a little concerned there for a minute. <laughs> grab the tiller. We're gonna start recording. Oh brother, we're hard that one. Wait, <laughs> we already have. Yeah, we keep doing this. Go grab the tiller. <laughs> yeah. Go on. That's the T pad. <laughs> it's the tiller. <laughs> okay, just for clarity for everyone, go watch the movie. Oh brother, we're hard thou, and you'll understand. Yeah. Then leave movie. your angry comments. <laughs> then get mad at us. <laughs> so. So EVA-1, Nelson, EVA-2 is Van Hooften. Nelson has the red stripes on his spacesuit. Okay. For reference. Okay. This EVA is only two hours and 38 minutes. Only? What a breeze. Barely out there. Yeah. So as you can see, here's Nelson going up to Solar Max. Mm-hmm. He's ready. He gets the T-pad ready. He's going to go grip onto it, and he bounces off. Uh-oh. Yeah. He does this two more times. He bounces off. Now, this becomes a problem because... He's starting to add to the spin of Solar Max, which they don't want to have happen. Uh oh. Not good. Yeah. What happened was so the grip, right? So it's got to grip onto this thing, right? Yeah. The plans given to NASA to build the T pad forgot to include one thing that prevented it from gripping. What? Uh, it was called a grommet. That's what they called it. So. Grommet. Yeah, they called it a grommet. Yeah, there's a little thing that prevented it from gripping on. This, of course, will never happen again except on STS-51A. <laughs> I don't get it. What's with spacecraft suppliers not knowing what they put on their spacecraft? What well, in the world? So astronauts can't fix them. Jeez. Man, makes repairs difficult. It makes it really difficult. So Nelson then tries to just grab onto the solar array and use the MMU to stop it from spinning. Oh, wow. Okay. That does so not work. brute forcing it. <laughs> yeah. That does not work. Oh, geez. Now it causes the spacecraft to spin on two axes. Oh, great. So now it's even more challenging. You made it, you made it worse. Ah, <laughs> oh, George, not the livestock. <laughs> so at that point, it's starting to lose its... Because uh, the solar panel's got a point at the sun. It stops doing that. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> also, the MMU's nitrogen pressure is really low. So they're worried that he's going to run out. So he can't come back. But that's oh. likely because it was cold. Okay. But... Again, safe side here. Yeah, right. yeah. Better not to not to find out the hard way. And also, Challenger's kind of running low on uh, rendezvous propellant, so they're like, okay, we're going to wave it off, we're going to go back, we're going to try again. Oh, okay. Yep, so the plant, so they go back into the shuttle. The Goddard team decides, how do we fix this? How right. do we get this so we can actually grapple onto it and, and do this? They also right. try to grapple it with the RMS at some point, too. I forgot to mention that. But that doesn't work either. Dang. So, I'm going to try it again. 
I'm going to wait. This actually extends the mission by a day. Oh. So they can fix it. Okay. So the crew does... So while they're waiting for a solution, the crew does astronaut things. Like bees. <laughs> <laughs> the, the face on Ox right there. That's a lot it's, of bees. <laughs> it's for, why do they put so many bees <laughs> yeah. in so space? That, again, look at... They got a little gym here, too. They're, oh, they're working out in space, too. You can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're trying to create super bees yeah, this in is, space. This is not going to work. Again, that kid at that school, you know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the emo kid. Like everything gets dark and desaturated around them. They have yeah. dark, uh, you know, like bags under their eyes, perpetually under I a want thunderstorm. Bees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you can see actually they're building the honeycomb here. You can see it. Oh, they are. Yeah, yeah there's look the at honeycomb. That. Yeah. So they're yeah. They're, <laughs> there's 3,300 bees. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's an interesting experiment to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, hey, it's working though, right? It is working. They're they're building a honeycomb and they're working out, chilling. <laughs> these are these are for the hard X-ray stuff, right? In the prison workouts, you know. Yeah, yeah. Getting, there's a tattoo parlor. You can't see it. That's what's under here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's called Honeywell, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So this is the bee experiment up close. It's okay. Just, it's so Could weird. you imagine how confused those bees must have been? Because it's like suddenly there's just no gravity anymore. Yeah. Well, there's. I got the results. I found the results of this experiment. It's pretty interesting. Not much detail on it, unfortunately, okay. but uh -uh. I'll tell you about it at the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So these are the astronauts. Just that's a lot of bees. <laughs> just checking out all the bees. <laughs> yeah. So here's Nelson. He's the one who had, looks like he had the most fun on the flight. Every photo of, I, of him I see. He's it looks like he's having a good time. That's so, great. <laughs> yeah. So here he is sneaking up on everybody from the mid deck, and now here he is manning the uh, uh, the drive through again. Uh. They get all the astronaut food there, showing it off the the purple. Yep. <laughs> we got purple. I got orange. Got I got orange. brown. <laughs> yeah, I got some brown. Oh, look at those. Those pepperonis or sausages. This could be. Yeah. This could be. Yeah. And they got of course got the condiments here. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I know on STS-40, actually, what happened was they, uh, they actually built a little economy because they brought along Tabasco sauce. Okay. One of the things that happens when you're in space, especially for missions like these, which are pretty short, mm -hmm. is you lose your sense of taste. It's not as strong as it is on Earth. Like fluid, really? It's fluid redistribution, I think. That's why their faces are puffy. Right. Yeah. And, and, that, and that affects taste. It affects their taste, apparently. So, so you have to get stronger stuff to... Yeah. So they brought Tabasco sauce up on STS-40, I think, and the astronauts loved it so much, they actually bargained with each other. Because like, <laughs> they have to clean and maintain the shuttle, right? They mm -hmm. bargained, like, okay, if you clean this, I'll give you some Tabasco, right? <laughs> or stuff like that. I'll do the cleaning if you give me the, right? Just, they built a little barter economy. <laughs> In space. Really, really live it up to the whole uh, hard X-ray stuff. Yeah, it's like ah, uh, this is worth you know some Tabasco sauce and three cigarettes. Yeah, three cigarettes, you know, a few shanks, you know. Yeah. As <laughs> so here's Nelson, he's having a good time on board. Uh, so here's Terry with the uh, with a sphere of fluid. They they always love doing that with their drinks. <laughs> well, yeah, it's space. What else are you gonna do with That's it? That's true. This is the one place you could play with your food. Yeah. And of course, you know, here's Crip looking on <laughs> in the in the, yeah, the mid-deck. All this stuff just floating around. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, Dick Scobie. There's all these all these ancient controls. Look at them. Look at all these switches. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's really cool. Got the wildcat behind the wheel. Oh, yeah. He's went to Arizona. Yeah. And then, so, now we're back to mission day six, April 11th. Again, okay. it's Nelson Van Hooften. They figure out how to fix it, as you can see. <laughs> yes. By this picture, <laughs> they've grappled onto it. Good, 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 good. So this EVA is nearly seven hours long. Oh, man. <laughs> so what Goddard does is they use magnetic torque bars to stabilize Solar Max into a slow spin. They then use the RMS to grapple it and put it in the payload bay. Okay. That's, okay. Yeah, that's it. So then Nelson and Van Hooften go to work. Van Hooften. Oh, oh, yeah, you've worked. Oh, you completed your seven hour EVA. Now it's time to get to work. Well, no, this is what seven hour EVA is for. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Van Hooften removes the retention bolts on the control system and replaces it. So it's one of these boxes. I think it's this one. They okay. also, they also, so these veins here, you know what those are for? 
Is it? Uh, I have no idea. What is thermal it management? I was I was gonna guess that. Yeah, they actually, like, use oh, propane as coolant. Really? Yeah. Huh. I, I learned that when I was reading about this. Why propane? Uh, it's got good thermal properties. It's got good. I think it's compressibility or something like that. Okay. Or there's I don't know. We're all grilling. We're all grilling. Why does the grill not work? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh! <laughs> someone took the someone put, took the uh, the propane tank and put it in space. <laughs> Oops! So then they start working on the MEB, which is more challenging because the screws, all twenty-two of them, are an eighth of an inch on diameter, Ooh. which is point three one seven five centimeters. Tiny. They're very tiny. Again, glove, big astronaut gloves. They described it like wearing boxing gloves. <laughs> yeah, that. Oh, they man. also had to use scissors to cut wires. Ugh. Yeah. So Van Hooften removes uh, the MEP. Well, just, just take off the gloves. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the problem? Just yeah. take off the gloves. Yeah. Someone can go to the hard x-rays, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the bees might get them. <laughs> get the bees to fix it. Yeah, yeah, they're small. They're, they're small. They could have done this. Yeah, they could have fixed this. What's, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> yeah, that's what they were training for. So uh, Van Hooften removes it, and then Nelson repairs, does, puts the new stuff in. Okay. Solar Max is saved. Woo-hoo! Yay! All thanks to the bees. Yep, the bees did it. Yeah. And they deploy it from the RMS on the next day. So nice. So you've got some pictures of this coming up. All right, okay. so this is what they attached it to. So this is the uh, servicing structure. So that's the tiller. Yep, that's the tiller. Okay. Yep, so then yeah, you can see there's the, again, oops, there's the spare... Uh, Attitude control on the left. These are the tools to repair the MEB on the right. Okay. Okay. Here's Ox in front of Solar Max. Okay. In the payload bay. And then, so that gas can there is a, an IMAX camera. Oh. So yeah. that's where Chris Nolan is hiding. That's where Chris Nolan's hiding. Yep. Got it. Got it. Okay. So here they are at work. So there's Ox. Because you can. So Ox is up here doing his repairs. Mm hmm. And then there's Nelson hanging out. Right, okay. Yep. So then we can see up here in the next picture, so they're doing repairs on the MEB, because they're right in the main structure of the spacecraft up here, the experiments. Right, okay. Yeah. That is an incredible view. Oh, it's great. Really cool. Yeah. Really cool job to have. <laughs> Just, you look down to see all the tiny screws, you look up to see the world. <laughs> yeah, and bees. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Infinite supply of bees. <laughs> yeah. So here we have. I think, I think this is Ox working on the. No. He's work. This is working on. Yeah, this is Ox working on the attitude control because he got the the vanes here. So this is attitude right. control box. But you can see what kind of a nightmare it is because all these little wires, <laughs> right? Yeah. And he's got these big gloves. Not good. Yeah. Just take the gloves off. Yeah. Just take them off. Yeah. And then over here, we have, so this is what they opened up, right? This is the MEB. This is where they attached it. These are the wires for it. Okay. As you can see. Yeah. Look at that, though. Isn't that pretty? It is gorgeous. Yeah. It's an amazing view of this spacecraft. See, that's the one benefit to this kind of program. You can go see spacecraft. <laughs> yeah. Go with them. Talk to them. Give them some bees. <laughs> Barter with them for Tabasco sauce. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so here's Nelson with the MEB. He's holding it. It's like, yeah, got it. <laughs> Why is there a B in there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, the ME, the B stands for B. <laughs> yeah. Main electronics, Bs. <laughs> ah! <laughs> well, you see all the different wiring, too. Look at all that. Uh, so you have Nelson and Ox uh, working on the MEB again. Mm-hmm. And they are working on it in spacecraft and space. Look how good these pictures are, too. Yeah. Well, oh, we got cool. Christopher Nolan out there with the he's, IMAX camera. Of course, yeah, he's popped out. Mm-hmm. I like how this is not labeled bottom on Solar Max, if you can see. Yeah, yeah, because you, you need to have, you, you need to know yeah, which way is up, which way is down. Yeah. You know, this side up. That, yeah. way, that way you know how to attach it. Yeah. So here's Solar Max being deployed. Wave goodbye wow. to it. We salute you, Solar Max. You've been fixed. The first ever on-orbit satellite repair. Nice. <laughs> Woo! 
It'll cost you three thousand bees and a bottle of Tabasco sauce. Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of honey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is awesome. <laughs> so Challenger lands at Edwards Air Force Base on April thirteenth, nineteen eighty four, and I think eight thirty eight in the morning Eastern. So this is the anniversary of the landing. Woo-hoo. Hey, hey, forty years ago. Yeah, uh, that's a long time ago. A long oh, time ago. <laughs> It spends six days, 23 hours, 40 minutes, and seven seconds in space, which is about 108 orbits. Wow. Yep. And here's a crew photo. Like, like all happy. And you can see Solar Max in the payload bay, as you can see, right? Ah, yeah. There's the yeah. antenna, and there's the solar arrays. That's great. And of course, this is where they did ACE satellite repair co, because... <laughs> <laughs> yep. So this mission, combined with 41B, would form the basis of STS-51A, which is what we've already done. Mm-hmm. We two satellites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, for the bee experiment, mm-hmm. the bees would produce a 30 square inch or 194 square centimeter honeycomb, which was larger than the one on the ground. Really? Yeah. The bees... They built it bigger. They built it better. Yes. They built it with space bees. Exactly. All that working out, you know? Yeah. Going to the gym, getting tattoos. Yep, so the bees could also fly, walk, float, and made a chain 10 inches long. What? Trying to break out, I guess. (laughs) Do some hard time there. Yeah. And the queen also produced 35 eggs. Good for her. Yeah, good for her. Good for her. So, bees in space. There we go. Yeah. (laughs) This is not the only time bees will fly in space, I think. Intentionally? Or, like... Intentionally. Okay. I know there's a few more ant experiments that would fly on space. Because we had the ants that flew on uh, STS-7, of course, which were all killed by NASA on the ground. Because yeah. they get too strong. They might build a giant honeycomb. <laughs> yeah. They knew too much. They knew what the bees were planning. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so Solar Max would uh, retire to a nice farm on December 2nd, 1989, uh, upstate in the Indian Ocean, burning up. Uh, Over this five-year period, it would discover 10 comets and showed that the sun is brighter during the sunspot maximum. So it's it's emitting more light when there's more sunspots? Yeah, so it's the area around the sunspots that is actually brighter than the sun on average. Those are brighter, so if you have more sunspots, you have more bright spots on it. Ah, okay. Yeah. And and there's more than the the darker spots, the sunspots. Yeah, there's more of them. Okay. Yeah, isn't that cool? That is fascinating, yeah. yeah. Wow. This is STS-41C. There's not much on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we learned about the uh, burgeoning uh, Tabasco sauce economy. And That's not even this flight. That's STS-40. Yeah, but I learned about it That's on true. this one. Yeah. Interesting mission. Not much on it, unfortunately. Which is a shame, yeah. because it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Bees. Bees in space. Bees in space. <laughs> yeah, there's Bees three in... interesting things on this mission. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they were fascinating. <laughs> oh, yeah. They just deployed LDEF, fixed Solar Max, and there were a lot of bees. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. I picked Solar Max because it was interesting. And then I started looking, because I always have, because the website I use, the Space Wiki, I always link it in the description. Mm-hmm. It has all these pictures. And I clicked on Bee Experiment. I'm on the test. Like, what is this? <laughs> And it was the image, the first image I showed you of the bee experiment where Ox is looking at it and it's like, those are bees. <laughs> what on earth is this? Why are there bees in space? What is going on? <laughs> so that helped. Yeah. Yeah. Fun mission. Great mission. Yeah. Yeah. This is a bit of a shorter episode, I can see. Yeah. So, yeah. Not all of them have to be an hour and 50 minutes of us talking about cold brews on Mars. Yeah, we can talk about Tabasco sauce and bees. Tabasco sauce and bees, yeah. Yeah. All right. So in the next episode, it's going to be a special. <laughs> what do you think? It lo- what, do you look- what does this look like to you? Well, it, uh, it, so far it looks like Starship development. <laughs> oh, so uh, launch there's... successes. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those all look successful to me. Yeah, you can tell by the fireball it's successful. <laughs> yeah. See, this one even cleared the pad. That's a success, right? Yeah, of course. It cleared the pad. That's a success. I- ignore this part right here. <laughs> yeah, ignore, ignore uh, exploding in, into a billion pieces. Ignore that. Uh, yeah, that's the next uh, episode. We're going to do some launch failures. That'll be fun. Nice.
I'm excited. Two Titans. It'll be fun. Yeah. You want to play us on out? Yep. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. Uh, leave your opinions about all the space bees and yes. Tabasco sauce in the comment section below. Yeah. And till next time, this has been End of Mission.